good. Guys, thank you guys for having me today. Um, obviously, we're in the month of Av. This is the month of repair, God willing. This is the month that, God willing, we're going to turn sorrow into joy. Is everybody is the hearing okay for everybody? Everybody can hear me good? Good? Perfect. So tonight's class, um, I'd like to touch 14 to 15 concepts of addiction through the eyes of Rabbi Nachman. I don't really want to speak so much about the 12 steps tonight because the 12 steps, I believe, is a whole different, it's a, it's a whole different class in itself strongly believe in the 12 steps the 12 steps work 100 percent. but what we want to talk about tonight is conditions that we can get to a person um through to an addiction and what we're not going to spoke about what we're not going to spoke about and i'm going to talk about 14 to 15 steps i'm going to talk take, most of them are all going to come from all his Torah, and they're going to give people a different perspective of, of it um, I have the pleasure, obviously, of owning a uh, rehab center and a detox center in, in, in Fort Lauderdale and Miami. And believe it or not, I use a lot of these teachings. And in these high Kabbalistic teachings are, are going to people sometimes from the Midwest. And they've never seen stuff like this. They've never, they've never seen words like this. And the effects that it has on them, it's, uh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable when you see, when you see a guy from Arkansas and you see a guy from, you know, Missouri, or you see a guy from Texas, you know, looking at Rabbi Nachman's teachings and all of a sudden getting inspired and being hungry for it. Um, you know, Rabbi Nachman said in his book called Tzadik, he says, the whole world needs me, including non-Jews. Even non-Jews need me. And he clearly explained to us that the amount of work that he has to go through his life, the amount of suffering that he goes, to, he got, he had to go through his life. Rav Nachman died at 39 years old, died very young. He lost many children. And he basically said that I did everything for you guys. All that I did, all the barriers, all the going heavily duty in the, in the human condition, dealing with tremendous amount of pain and going through all that he went through, he did it for us today so we can have, we can grasp onto something in these dark times. And Rav Nachman clearly told us before we even start this class that everybody is suffering, that this world is more like a world of Gehinam than the world, than the Olam Hazeh. Nobody has Olam Hazeh here. There's no question that this year, 2020 has shown us that. And nobody has a Lam Hazeh here. Everybody is riddled with some kind of suffering in their life, whether it be family members and people in addictions or, or people losing jobs or, or people who got forbid are sick. There's no question that there's only one place to run to. It, it would not be unnormal. It would be normal for anybody right now to seek to escape some kind of substance today. I don't think they would, they would call you abnormal today. Um, everybody's, everybody wants, it's some kind of escape from what's, what's going on today. And Rav Nachman gave us, and he told us exactly where, where do you run to. So let's, let's talk about 14 to 15 steps that I came up with that I think, are, I think are, they're going to be short, but I think they're very relatable to the human condition of suffering, to the human condition of wanting to, 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 to escape life. And, you know, the ultimate goal here is, you know, and, I, I, and, I, and I, this is something I meditate every day in my head. I myself am recovering from gambling, from a gambling addiction over 20, 22, 23 years ago. And I myself tell myself that I love the pain. Pain, pain changed my life. I'm going to be honest with you. The pain that I went through in my life, it changed my life. And pain does two things to us. It either changes your life or it completely breaks you. Or it just, I don't see the, the option in between. It's either changing you into growth or, God forbid, breaking the person and getting that person, unfortunately, um, not understanding life. So one of the conditions that we, you constantly see in, in addiction is a, is, a constant, is a constant despair. A person always despairing, God forbid. A person seeing that there's no hope in life. And the definition is very simple. That growth is non-negotiable. And the ability to accept, accept pain turns into growth. And then growth 
the rest is history. But when we have pain in our lives and we don't accept the pain, and we escape from the pain, then it turns into what? It turns into suffering. And unfortunately, the despair, the definition of despair, is suffering without meaning. I mean, suffering in life and not understanding why you're suffering, not understanding the battle, not understanding the, not understanding anything. So that's what usually get, get the person to, God forbid, seek these substances today. So the whole point is to avoid the, this concept of despair. So let's talk about number one. My opinion that I've seen, there are usually two conditions, and I, and I ask these questions across, across the board. There's usually two conditions that I see that people have a tendency to, to, to use mind-altering substances. It's either trauma, a traumatic event in that person's life that's haunting them, or a lack of meaning. You know, person living 18, 19, 20 years old, not, not feeling anything, not feeling any purpose, just, you know, there's no meaning in life. No meaning, no, nothing, to, nothing to look forward to, no, no spirituality. So you can, I'm going to touch on those two things first. Trauma and lack of meaning is a common thing I constantly see um, between addicts, you know, in, in, in addicts. So let's talk about first, let's talk about trauma. What is this concept of trauma? And why does it happen to us? Rabbi Nachman tells us very simple that in order for you to ultimately get free choice in this world, evil has to exist. Evil exists. Where did evil, how was evil created? Evil was created through the breaking of the vessels. And this great book called In All Your Ways, Rav Schechter, he says Rav Nachman made a very powerful statement. He says there's no despair in the world today. There's no despair in the world. It's, despair is, is a, it doesn't exist. These are, not, these are not new words, and he says here, but we're not going to look at the very root of creation from beginning to the end, and he saw that despair does not exist. That God created his world, and nothing ever is lost. Everything can achieve his final decision. We need to understand that we are here to repair. And you constantly see this all the time. Wow, I'm trying to fix my business. I'm trying to repair my business. I'm trying to repair my marriage. I'm trying to repair my relationship with my children. I'm trying to repair my, my, my body because I'm, I'm not healthy. We're always in the repair mode. It seems to be like this repair concept is just like nobody's whole. Everybody's repairing something in this world. And why is this always happening? It's like we're always repairing. Once we finish repairing this, then another thing breaks. And then now you have to repair that. And then once you, fi- you, you finally fix that, and like, okay, now I can have some peace. Next thing you know, another thing breaks. It's like we're always repairing in life. And unless you start understanding this process, that your life is never going to be comfortable. Like we said, maybe the only thing that's going to be comfortable in your life is maybe your underwear. But nothing is going to be comfortable in this world. And it's always going to be a repair. And this ultimately comes from the creation. According to Kabbalah, when the world was created, an event called the breaking of the vessels. So simply put, God's powerful light was revealed at that time, and it was too much intensity to hold, and, that, and the light broke. And the Midrash says, before God created the world, he made and destroyed worlds. Because these worlds I like, these worlds I don't like. That is, the first hand to be the breaking, the breaking of the vessels is where all destruction and repair, remember, the breaking of the vessels in our life is what allowed evil to exist in this world today. So many times people are stuck in traumatic situations where, where something really evil has happened to them. And evil has to exist in the world where the job of evil is, is to hide good. And our job in life is to overcome evil, not to understand it. And he says here, according to the Arizal, the breaking of the vessels is not a one-time occurrence. It's something that is constantly happening to us. I myself was divorced. I got remarried. There's so much breaking, so many things breaking. You know, you, you, three years ago, I had to take a business and I had to completely break it to rebuild it. And you could either get stuck in trauma or you can start being resilient and moving on. But 
you cannot avoid the breaking because for newer vessels to come in our lives, the old ones have to break. For new relationships to come to our lives, the old ones have to break. So if a person is stuck in trauma or he's stuck in the past, something broke in his life, something broke, somebody did something to him. This is rooted in, again, this is built into creation. It's built into creation. That means people should be told when they're younger, by the way, you're going to have some kind of tra traumatic breaking in your life. No matter who you are, it's going to happen. But this is what you do. Your job in this world is not to understand it. Your job is to repair it. And once I understand that, I no longer look at the person. I no longer fight, fight evil. I focus on overcoming, overcoming it. I'm focusing on the repair. I'm not interested in who broke the, the vase. I'm not interested in who broke the chandelier. I'm interested in how am I going to repair it. And that is exactly what it says here. That our job, even though God repaired the world after the original breakage, he left the job unfinished. The job is unfinished. The job is for you to come into this dark world, for you to come in here with your, which we're going to talk about here, with your addiction issues. You're, you're to come in here with all your, 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 your break, your brokenness in the one area of our lives and to repair, not to understand. This is what the, where the word Amuna comes into the place. If a person does not understand the bigger purpose in this world, that our job is to repair, our job is to fix things. Our job is to, to recognize that we're, we're, the darkness comes to everybody. I'm not isolated. I'm not the only one getting darkness in this world. We're all getting it together. Then I no longer have to hide from it. I no longer have to, have to, have to numb it. I start embracing life. I start getting, be a, being a partner in, with, with Hashem. But to the extent that I'm trying to avoid pain by avoiding the breaking of the vessels, I'm basically avoiding my purpose in this world. I'm avoiding my whole, my, my growth. So basically you avoid everything. So when you don't, when we don't, ex, when we don't embrace pain and when we don't embrace the breakage, we don't, when we get excited over the, of, of repairing, basically we're basically losing the purpose of us being here in this world. Because like God, God could have created you in a beautiful rosy world with no problems. He could have taken you he could have put you in a perfect world, but what, again, what is the purpose of you being in this world? Our purpose of this world is to overcome this darkness. And this is exactly why we have all these endless ups and downs, these ups and downs, these breaking, these things break, that breaks. It's constant repair. And if a person doesn't have a resilient mindset today, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it. There's no option for strength today. There is no other option today but strength. Like the Zohar says, at the end of the battle, they're going to ask you, what are you holding in your hand? They're not asking you, did you kill the guy or not? They're asking you, are you still holding, are you still holding the, the, the instruments in your hand? That means that you're still in the game. So our job is not to understand. Our job is just to constantly, like Rav Natsum says in the Kute Halachot, to constantly empower us, constantly strengthen ourselves and rebegin and constantly start over again and not get frustrated by the process and not fall into despair and not run away. It's to constantly rebegin over and over and over again. Now, if I understand this concept, then trauma no longer bothers me. Tra trauma doesn't, doesn't hold me back. Trauma no, no longer breaks me. My post-traumatic stress becomes my post-traumatic growth. But if I don't have the spirituality, if I don't understand the, basic, the basics of creation, that breaking of the vessel is something that happens to all of us, no matter who you are. So when you look at today and you see somebody divorced, somebody's looking less at them. Oh, he's divorced. Look what's wrong with him. Something must be wrong with him. Oh, look at his child. Is this. We always constantly, we judge other people's breaking, the breakings. And, and, and each one has a, a different thing that needs to be repaired based on their soul, based on their mission. So it teaches you when you recognize how much work you have to do yourself. The last thing you're going to do is obviously judge somebody else's is, is sorrows in their life and somebody else's um, problems and, and, and things that they're going through. We have to be in all this together. But remember, you, the number one thing is the running away from, from, from pain is what's causing more pain because the breaking of the vessels is, is something that's built into creation. And you, you, you can't run away from it. And God himself, he, the Midrash says, God himself, 
made worlds before he created this world, and he broke and he and he destroyed worlds. So this is all built in. A person has to hang on today through his emuna, his emuna. That's it. Today, throw away your logic today. You have to jump into emuna today like you've never jumped before. If you had a problem with emuna before 2020, you need to jump into. You need to go ten times in emuna today to survive today. So that's the first aspect, avoiding understanding the, the, the breaking of the vessels, understanding where evil exists, and not getting caught up in the situation, but getting caught up in the repair. Not getting caught up in the why me, but getting caught up more in the what's next. That's the first aspect. Second aspect I want to talk about is lack of meaning. So Ramnachman tells us here in Lesson 268. He tells us, what are you here in this world for? If a person does not focus on a goal, if he doesn't focus on a spiritual goal, why is he alive? The soul constantly yearns to do the will of his creator. But when she sees that the person does not want to do the God's will, heaven forbid, she, she, she yearns greatly to return to her source. She therefore begins to withdraw herself from the body. So practically today, how does a person become sick? B- becoming sick is when a person is too involved in this world and all of a sudden the soul starts to depart from the body. And when the soul starts to depart from the body, this is what makes the person sick. Let's say the person has no spirituality and all he cares is about money, food, drugs, etc. Then that, that, that soul is suffering in that person's body because that, body, that soul is not getting any substance. That soul is, getting, is, is completely dehydrated. So it'd rather go back to the source where it was created. From the, from, the, from the light of Ain Self. So what happens as the soul begins to depart from the body, then the body starts suffering. And what happens, what does what he say here? So what happens is when a person becomes sick, all of a sudden that person is humbled. That person all of a sudden is suffering. That person is taking bitter medicine. That person is all of a sudden doing self, self uh, he's, doing, he's checking his midot. So what happens is when, it, when, the, when the soul sees that that body can take some suffering, and it could take some serious things, all of a sudden the soul goes back into the body and he's healed. So clearly, lack of meaning. When we don't have any meaning in our lives, we start getting into aggression, addiction, and, 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 and all kinds of other situations. It's very important that a person has to come to this world and he has to do his job to recognize his creator and to find out and to search. Just like, very simple. Imagine if you're in the you're in the middle of uh, Aventura Mall, and you lost your keys. Okay, I lost my keys. That's it. I guess I'll stop searching. What are you going to do? Stand in the parking lot your whole life? Wait? No. You have to search. Our job in this world is to search. If you don't like one section of Judaism, you need to search for another one. If you don't like something that doesn't, li- that doesn't like, that you don't, you don't connect with, your job in this world is to search until you find it. It's not to say, oh, I tried that, I tried that, I'm not, I'm not searching anymore. This is the problem with this generation today. They're too busy not searching. We need to search. So how I find Rabbi Nachman's teachings, it was not by somebody told, it was searching. I was, I was in darkness. And I said, something's got to give here. I'm in tremendous amount of darkness. I'm asking my creator, what to get closer to you? I was in darkness. You have to search. And when the student is ready, the teacher comes. But your job in life is, is to fi- find meaning in your life. Ask your creator what's the meaning in your life. Try to find, search. But when you stop searching, that's the worst thing to do. Because then you lose meaning, you lose purpose, you lose your connection, etc. So that's the second thing. And then obviously, what are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to mindful. You're going to turn to other, other types of spiritual experiences, which is drugs, etc. So that's number two. We have to find meaning in our lives. No, fe- no meaning. There's, there's, what are we here for in this world? What are we here for in this world? To make money, pay bills, do that? What are we here for? To watch NBA games? I mean, what are we here? There's got to be a bigger purpose that we're here for. Number three. We're not going to talk about number three as the difference between, it's very important that knowing the condition of pain that we're going to be in 
He talks about how we should deal with it. And he's saying there's a very big difference today between having a broken heart and depression. We all have a tendency to, to like we said, we have a t- the world, there's every every person in, in, in recovery, every person that's going through an addiction, there's no question the amount of pain they're going through. But the way they approach their creator is very simple. One way through a broken heart. As our sages say, there's no, nothing greater than a broken heart, and there's nothing worse than a person who's whole. So his, his Ramachman says there's a difference between a broken heart and depression. They're not the same. A broken heart involves the heart, where depression involves the spleen. The spleen is drawn to melancholia. The spleen is drawn to more shora. The spleen is, do, is drawn to depression. The difference between a broken heart, a broken a person broken hearted, he cries to God out of, under, out of not understanding. He cries to God out, out of being lost in this world. God forbid depression is, you gave me the wrong, you gave me a miserable life. Why would I even come to you? Why would I even pray? So the difference between broken heart and depressed, one continues to pray. One continues to yearn. The other one says, what's the point of this world? This world is broken. There's no praise for me in this world. So he gave us all the difference. And he says here that after a broken heart comes joy. So there's a big difference between a piece of person being broken heart and being depressed. There's no condition, no question. Every one of us should have a broken heart today. Because first of all, we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. First of all, we're lost in this world. We're facing anti-Semitism like it's never, like it's beyond. Nothing makes sense today. You have to ha- sit down with a broken heart and tell your creator we are lost. Or whether it's a Shidduch crisis where, where, where a person can't find the soulmate. And, and, and cry out with a broken heart. That prayer is powerful. A prayer of self-pity and depression not only does not work, but it leads to more negativity, more constriction. So that's why the difference between a broken heart and, and spleen. Broken heart is from the heart. Depression, God forbid, is from the spleen, etc. So it's very, very important that we understand that. Rav Nachman also says, number four, Rav Nachman says, unless the 195, something beautiful. He's saying here, that 195, give me a second. One second, guys. Less than 195. People normally think that a person's solution is somewhere else. That I have to go outside of myself to find the solution. And it's completely false. The Nachman tells us in 195, less than 195, in my distress, we could say, in my addiction, in my addiction, you relieved me. In my addiction, I found my God. You know how many people tell me my, my, my rehab centers? I found God in this, in this place. It's not a church. It's not a synagogue. It's the middle of a rehab. And they say, I found God. Uh, it's an unbelievable thing to see. That means, in my distress, you have relieved me. This is from Psalms 4. That is, even in the distress itself, God provides you with relief. For if a person considers God's kindness, he will see that God causes him distress. In the distress itself, God provides you with the relief and increases his kindness for them. That means the solution is coming from the problem is the solution. In my distress, even in the distress itself, you provide me relief from it. Not only do we look God to save us from our problem, but if we look God to show us, to find it, that in the actual, the problem is the solution. Like our sages say that the axe to chop off the wood in the forest, the, the handle to the axe is made from the same forest that you lost it. So, you know, when a person recognizes that his addiction is the greatest gift that came to him, even though it's a horrific thing. But once he turns it into a spiritual awakening, like, like Bill W. says, that, and Carl Jung, they all, they all speak about the same thing, that the solution for a spirit, spirit refers to as alcohol, alcohol and spirits, is a yearning for spirituality, right? Jung wrote that alcoholism results from a deep, unfulfilling desire for spirituality, he referenced the Latin word called spiritus, meaning higher power. So as he says, and he quoted from Psalms 42, as a, as a heart cries longly, so does my heart cry to you. 
it's this craving to get closer to our creator. So you could see that we shouldn't think that the solution to our problems is, is outside. We should understand that the solution to the problem is inside the problem. How do you refer to this? Many times singles can't get married. And if it wasn't for their problem of not getting married, all of a sudden they start keeping Shabbat. Next thing you know, if it wasn't for the, them being not being married, now all of a sudden because of their problem, they were more open-minded, they started keeping Shabbat. Next thing you know, their whole spirituality changed from their problem. You understand? From their problem is usually the solution. That's what we have to do. It's very important that we shouldn't look outside of ourselves. We should always look inside, inside of ourselves. It's funny because when I was going through my, my situation eight, nine years ago, a terrible divorce, etc., I literally had tikkun atzot outside of my, outside of my house. I never did it. After that, that's when my spiritual awakening came, after all the pain that I went through. But literally, I had the ability to do tikkun atzot right inside. It was right in front of my face. I just didn't see it. So, like our sages say that the Yeshua is always there. The, 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 the Yeshua is always there in our lives. It's just concealed from us. You have to beg and, and ask your creator to make it revealed. Number number five. Number five, Rabbi Nachman talks about Lesson 36, something very, very beautiful. And he's saying here that all of us, every single one of us, has a tendency for some kind of addiction, some kind of exile. Rabbi Nachman says here that from the house of Yaakov, we, refer, we represent the house of Yaakov, has to go into exile of the 70 nations. We know there's the 70 faces of Torah, but there's also the 70 nations that we refer to. 70 nations refer to all the addictions, all the, the food, the, the sex, the money. This can, these are the addictions of the 70 nations. And he's saying here that each of us get enslaved in the 70 nations, and we have to cry out like a pregnant woman to be saved from these addictions. All of us. No matter who you are, you're either addicted to money, sex, or food. All of us, all of us, hats, no hats, payers, no payers, religious, not religious, I don't care who you are. We all have a tendency to, ha to be in exile in some kind of way. And he's saying here, this is the principle. Before a person gets a taste of spirituality, before a person gets a taste of his creator, you know what he says here? The person is tested and he's, and he's set into exile of the 70 nations and in their desires. And when, she, when that person comes into these contracts, these traits of their, their exile, each person has to scream. Basically, you get put in Egypt. Egypt represents your addictions. Egypt represents all of our problems, all of our addictions. Before I was addicted to gambling, then we picked up another addiction. These addictions were all of us. You shouldn't think less of yourself because you have this issue. You should recognize that unless you're screaming, unless you're running out of Egypt, you're already back there. Unless you're screaming like a pregnant woman that's in labor, to exit out of that particular trait, that person is going to get stuck in that trait. It's very simple. It's the, the, the addiction is like a pregnant woman. And whether or not you're screaming to get out, whether or not your desire for that baby to come out is how you're going to get taste, taste the light. You know why? Because the light's not for everybody. Not everybody gets the light of Hashem. Not everybody gets the light of Amunah. Not everybody gets the light of, of being connected to their creator. It's a light that comes to, that you have to earn. And the way to earn that light is by screaming out in darkness and showing your creator how, how desperate you are for this light. And Rabbi Nachman tells us here that prior to any revelation of the Torah, that is the concept of pregnancy. That person is sent in exile. And he's saying here, these exiles that we speak about are the shells preceding the fruit. The, we, all, we all have a shell. We're born with a shell. We're born with a tendency to, to go into something else, to want something else, to want money, sex, food. And if we don't have a desire to exit that, then what happens? We're going to get stuck in that. We're going to get stuck in that shell which is the klipa, basically hides the good from our lives. And no, what is he saying here? No, 
that in all the 70 nations, there's one desire that if you break this desire, if you break one desire, you can break all of them. What does Rabbi Nachman tells you? If you can break the desire for sexual, for sexual, the sexual desire is the, is the, is the toughest one to break. But once you break that one, everything else will be easy for you. Everything else you can handle. Like Rabbi Nachman tells you, if you can break the desire for sexuality, which is so difficult, and I can't tell you every other phone call when I hear it today, people are calling me, I lost my wife, I have no money, or they're telling me I'm stuck in this desire. It's all related to pornography. It's all related to spilling seed. It's all related to sexuality. Across the board, the amount of, of sorrow that I hear from this problem, it's all, all rooted in usually this. So Rav Nachman says here that if you can break that desire, everything else is easy for you. But if you can't break that desire, that is the hardest one that can overcome everything else. So understanding that if you have a tendency, if you have these desires for, for sex, if you have a desire for food, if you have desires for money, nothing's wrong with you. Everybody has them. Your job is to fight, with, for, infuse spirituality in your life, to cool off these desires and elevate them. Because you can't just come into this world and think, okay, I'm going to deal with these desires with no spirituality. You're going to be drowned out by these desires. So it's unbelievable how Rabbi Nachman tells them, by the way, all of you are stuck in this problem. So it's not like I'm the only guy, she's the only person, something's wrong with me, a person's questioning his, his, maybe he did something wrong, or if a person's questioning maybe, you know, why am I, why will only me get stuck in, it's the, the, the difference is, is most people hide them and they're not honest with themselves and they're doing it on the, on the side. But the reality is, is across the board, everybody has them. And this is exactly why their stages say that if they took away this tava from a person, then chickens would stop laying eggs. So we all have it and we have a tremendous tendency for it. It's whether or not we fight for it can we calm this desire down. Specifically, that's why we encourage people to get married because this way you can channel desires easily. If a person's not married, it's very hard to even fight this and this desire can, can, can affect them and all that, et cetera. Number six, Rav Nachman talks about, if we talk about cravings, the high does not come from the actual drug itself. The high comes from the craving to get to the drug. I remember going to Vegas and I, 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 was, I got more of a high booking my tickets to the casinos than going on the plane and, and, and getting to the table. Once I was at the table, I was like, this is all what, I'm, this is all what I've been running for. Is, is, and, we, and I say this line all the time. If you gave an addict an unlimited supply of his favorite drug and he had no downer, and he, all he wanted, the most heroin that he wanted, cocaine, alcohol, he would eventually not want it anymore because his high does not come from the drug itself. His drug comes from the craving to get there. So what does Rav Nachman tell us so beautifully? He says this 250 years ago. That all oh, that the evil inclination is like a prankster that runs through the crowd, showing everybody what he's got in his hand. No one knows what he's holding. Each one thinks, oh, he's holding, he's holding exactly my happiness. Each one imagines that his, whole, his hand contains exactly what his desires more. They run after him like a prankster. And he's tricked them all. When he opens his hand, it's nothing. So what is the Rav Nachman saying? That all these cravings that we have, he compares, he gives us a, gives us a great example. He tells us they're like a, a sunbeam in a dark room. The room is dark, and you're thinking that's going to make you happy. So what happens? You run after that light, and then when you grasp it, it's nothing. It's a sunbeam in a dark room. All of these cravings that we have are all sunbeams in a dark room. So if we understand how many times we hear, wow, if I got that girl, I'd be so happy. Okay, you got the girl, next thing you know, oh, that's it. He's not happy anymore. He reached his goal. Or how many times you hear the guy, oh, if I make a billion dollars, I'll be the happiest. The guy is completely depressed. What we recognize that once you're running for something, you already lost the battle. Once you need a condition to make you happy, you already lost the battle. Because you're going to, at the end of the day, the Yetzirah is always showing you exactly what you have in your hands. So that's why the key is not to pursue something. If you want something in life, already become it. Feel it like you already have it. Don't run after it. 
Because if you run after it, once you get it, you're going to recognize it. This is what I've been running for my whole life. I'm wasting. It's like my whole life. You can ruin your whole life just on cravings. And remember, what we really need to crave is spirituality, not toxicity. So anytime the craving hits my brain, I have to start thinking it's the Yetzirah, it's a sunbeam in a dark room. Beautiful, beautiful concept that really, really helped me out. Number six. Well, believe number seven. Bread of shame. We know that this concept called the bread of shame is a spiritual concept that anything that we receive in our lives without earning it leads us to shame. That's why after a person uses drugs at the end of the day, it's usually when it comes into treatment because you would figure, okay, you got the drugs, you should be happy. But what happens is, is you got those drugs. It's like stealing light. Anytime you, you alter your mind with, a, with, a, with, a, with an altered mind experience without earning it, what happens is, is it's like stealing light. You, you, it can't stay with you because you didn't earn it. So when people tell me, oh, marijuana calms me down, um, or they tell me I wouldn't be nowhere, I wouldn't have nowhere without marijuana. No, you need emuna. You don't need marijuana. You want to be calm in life? You have to learn. You have to work on your dots. You have to pray for it. But if you tell me marijuana calms me down and makes me so chill, it takes away all my headaches, what you're really doing is you're avoiding, you're avoiding the problem. Eventually, that problem's going to come back to you 10 times. Or I, can't, I don't know what my shalom vibe would be if I wasn't smoking marijuana. Or you, brother, you got a big problem. Because if you're thinking marijuana is going to solve your shalom vibe problem, how mistaken can you be? The solution to your shalom vibe problem is when you fix your, creation, you fix your relationship with your, fa- with your father in heaven, he fixes your relationship with your wife. It has nothing to do with your wife. So any attempt to avoid or any attempt to, to get some kind of light without earning it, it can lead you to shame, bottom line. Just like if you were at a wedding, you would never sit in the first row at a wedding that you were invited to because you're eating the food, but you can't eat that food because you weren't invited. Even nobody sees you, even if nobody says something to you, deep down in your heart, you know that that food was, you didn't earn it. So what happens is deep down inside, you could be at the most gorgeous wedding, but you can't eat that food with, 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 with tranquility because you were invited to the wedding. You crashed the wedding. You got something that you didn't earn. So the same thing, anytime they were pursuing something without earning it, it can lead us to shame. So that's why pornography leads to shame. That's why addictions and drugs lead to shame, because you're stealing light. Drugs are an altered experience. If I want to get an altered experience in my life, I have to wake up at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. I have to meditate. I have to work on myself. It could take me half an hour, 45 minutes to get to that experience. It doesn't just push a button, take something, and boom, I'm there in a minute. So obviously, the difference between a spiritual high experience and and a difference between a drug experience is what leads you to shame, and the other one stays with you, and it's, and you you and you can always connect to that. So understanding that all forms of escaping or or, or changing your mindset by not working for it, it can lead you to shame. And this is the concept of the bread bread of shame, that you have to start loving the struggle. How do you fix the bread of shame? You start recognizing that the struggle, the more you struggle, the more the less likely. What happens is when I struggle at something, there's no shame afterwards. There's no shame. If I run a two, three, three miles on a, on a, on a, on a, on a Peloton, or if I, I, I earned that sweat. I earned it. So it stays with me. I don't feel bad afterwards. So this is a concept in Kabbalah called the bread of shame, that if you receive something without, without working for it, it's going to lead you to shame. So that's why people are so upset about the struggles Start loving the struggle because the struggle at the end of the day stays with you. You never get something that you get if you don't work for it. Remember that. So you don't even want to get it. You don't even want to go run after it. You have to start loving the, loving the struggle. Number eight, the relationship between self-esteem and, and, and obviously one of some of the things that causes the loser self-esteem is trauma, childhood problems, etc. But what Nachman spoke about very, very important that the amount of effort that a person spends on himself fighting an addiction is based on his self-esteem. Very simple. If you love yourself, you'll invest in yourself. 
if you don't love yourself, you're going to lose yourself. So the key here is to really get a grip. We all have to get a grip on our self-esteem. We really have to love ourselves. Self-love is the number one step. Even when a person understands he's at the lowest place, he's in the lowest place in his life, he still has to love himself by finding the good points in himself. Because remember, you're never going to put an effort into somebody you don't love. So if you love yourself, it's okay. then you'll be willing to, uh, to, to fight for the cravings. Then you'll be willing to, to, to invest in yourself. But when you don't love yourself, then why would I, why would I love somebody I don't, I don't why, would I, why would I put effort into somebody I don't love? So the key to self-esteem and, and addiction is a huge, huge connection. To, and many times the reason why we, lo- we lose ourselves is because we don't love ourselves. The key, the key solution is, is to love ourselves. Number nine. Very important, what I'm not going to say here, and this is one of my favorite concepts, that number nine, give me a second. A person's relationship with time. Time, usually, if you see people in recovery, or if you see people in, in, in the rooms, or you see people in, in, in rehab, they're always saying, when am I going to get to the next step? When am I going to get to PHP? When am I going to get to IOP? When am I going to go home? When am I going to the job? When am I going to go here? When am I going to go here? They're always, time fights them. Time is the biggest enemy for a person in recovery. Why? Because their whole problem in life was instant gratification. So how do they ultimately fix it? Through delayed gratification. Rav Nachman tells us in Lesson 61, an unbelievable Torah. He tells us that God is beyond time as he's brought. This matters is truth and amazing. It is impossible for the human mind to understand that God is above time. But no, time essentially stems from nothing more but a deficient comprehension because our intellects are limited. The, more, the greater the intellect, the more time contracts is nullified. What does that mean practically? That the, more, the, more, the greater my intellect, the more time doesn't bother me. The less my intellect in my life, the more anxious I am, the more in a hurry I am to get to the next place. Because what is the job of the ego? The job of the ego is to always tell you that the next moment is greater than this moment. It, it does anything but to keep you from dealing with the moment. Because the moment is painful. So you always want to run to the next moment. That's why today we're so desperately, people are desperately, they can't stay, they can't be present. They desperately have to do something. They can't just sit and just be with themselves a little bit. I need to have my phone. I need to have this. To have, I, I always need a new moment. But technically, the more in a hurry we are in life, it's because it's showing us we're in a deficient, a deficient, we have a deficient intellect. I took my kids a couple of days to go to like a little um, uh, a, a toy place. And, you know, the, my kids are almost three years old. So we tell, we tell them, listen, we're, I mean, we're going to get to it in 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Oh my God, 30 minutes? How long? When are we going to get there? So long, 30 minutes. What do you mean 30 minutes is so long? 30 minutes will pass like this. This class is already 45 minutes. But 30 minutes for a child is, is the world because that person's intellect is deficient and they see 30 minutes as an enemy. 30 minutes is so long. It's beyond me. I can't handle the time. The same thing, the opposite also. The more we understand we love the process, the prize no longer bothers us. We understand that this is a process. The process is the prize. But the, the more we try to change the price, what happens? The process begins bothering us. Dating begins bothering you when you're trying to say, if I just got married, I'd be happy. You lost the process because now you need the condition to be happy. But when you start loving the process, you don't care about the prize. And you could, because you, you're focused on that is the process. You, you, time no longer bothers you. So you can see clients when they let go and they, and they finally say, you know what? I really want to change myself. Time no longer bothers them. But the clients that are constantly in a hurry to get to the next step are always relapsing. Why? Because they're always thinking the best, next moment is better, but they're, it's really showing them that their they're, they're, they're intellect is very deficient because time bothers them. They're always saying that time is going to be a next moment. And we could take this concept of um, delayed gratification versus instant gratification from Yaakov and Esau. What did ya- what was whole ya- Yaakov thing? Yaakov sold his pack of, sold his lentils 
and sold his, his, his for for food. And Asaph, what is Asaph? What Asaph wanted it now. Asaph wanted instant gratification now. The food wasn't even cooked. Because what did Jacob say? He was focused more on the birthright. So our ability to, to choose instant gratification versus delayed gratification is also being present. When a person is constantly saying, I need the next moment, I need the next situation, then this is why a lot of people that have anxiety, there's, there's always outcome obsession. There's always an outcome obsession. They're not patient. They're not enjoying the moment. That is only showing you that time bothers you. Time bothers you. It's telling you your intellect is, 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 is contracted and your job is not to fix and make the, the time quick, put back the time. Your job is to be more in the, to get more present, expand your mind. And then when you expand your mind, time no longer bothers you as much. And this is why when people try to do what he's about to do, so they try to meditate. How long do you have to do it? 30 minutes, 40 minutes? <gasps> it's forever. They, 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 they can't do it. Because what happens is they're not in the moment. Once you start getting into a good prayer, you're getting into the vacas, you're getting into connecting to Hashem, you're not even going to recognize what happened with the time. You're going to like, oh my God, where was time? I didn't even recognize how long I was here. That means you're there. It means you're focused and you're there and you're connected to your creator. But once you're checking your minutes, how long is it? And five minutes yet? 10 minutes yet? 15 minutes yet? You're not there. You're not there. That's why time bothers us so much. And showing us What's, when time bothers us so much, it's clearly showing us black and white that our intellect is flawed and we have to work on our intellect and we have to expand our mind and we have to expand our intellect. And, that, and that's one thing that when I already see a client chasing, the, chasing already the prize without, without understanding the process, it's a guaranteed relapse because he's not even here. He's thinking already of the, of the next moment. The difference between, the next step is talking about the difference between bittal and escaping. The opposite of, of addictions is bittal. We speak about bittal all the time. What is bittal? Bittal is closing your eyes to a much bigger picture. Purposely, a person has to go through pain in this world, as we just said. But unfortunately, we don't normally seek our creator. We're not looking for this light. Only through pain. When a person goes through pain, he closes his eyes. For example, you, you're getting your toothache. Somebody's taking something in your tooth. It's a natural thing for a person to close his eyes. Or when he's going through some pain, or when he hears something, or when he gets scared, he closes his eyes. What are you doing when you're closing your eyes? You're closing your eyes to a, a light that's beyond your comprehension. And Rav Nachman says when a person does that, when he goes into bittal, when he cancels himself out, when he nullifies his own mind and enters into emunah, he enters into bittal. The opposite is addiction recognizing the pain, not closing our eyes to a pain, but numbing the pain. That causes the problem even worse. Because the problem is, you're not, not only you're not dealing with the problem, in Bittu, I'm at least closing my eyes and transforming to recognize that my, the reason why I'm suffering right now is because God took away my comprehension. But if I really know that this situation is the best for me, it's just the problem is I'm not seeing it. So what do I need to do? I need to close my eyes and enter Emunah. This is when we say Shema Israel. We don't open up our eyes because Shema Israel is not here in Aichad. What is Shema Israel? It's telling you that the name of Yudke Vavke and the name of Elohim is one. So you're recognizing this issue is the problem that I'm seeing. Why I'm suffering so much is because I'm not looking at one. I'm not looking at there's only one in the world. I'm saying there's two. I'm saying there's two. Two represents. Two, two, two represents already the opposite, idolatry. But one represents it's happening for me. So through it's naturally that a person has to understand when he gets hit with tremendous obstacles, his job is not to try to, again, understand and go into Bittal. Go into Bittal by closing your eyes, like Ram Nachman says, and making yourself into nothing. Closing your eyes. When you're walking down Manhattan today, you can't logically see that. You see the city that was, I mean, I miss New York. I miss going there. I miss, I miss going out to eat and shopping. And, and it was such a beautiful city. And when you're going out there and you're seeing the city the way it is, you have to close your eyes and saying, oh my God, what happened? And if I even think about what happened, I, my, my, my mind can't handle it. My mind won't be able to handle it and see what's going, what happened to the city. 
So you have to close your eyes and know that this has happened for a much bigger reason and that we can't comprehend. We can't comprehend what happened to Manhattan, Madison Avenue. You can't comprehend it. So there's times where you have to close your eyes and recognizing that God knows what he's doing. I can't comprehend it. So I'm not even going to attempt to understand it. I'm going straight into Emuna. So that's the difference between Vittel and, and, and addictions. I always said that one of the best ways that maybe we need to change, you know, the, the, our sages say when a person changes his mazel, change the name of it to something, it changes your mazel. So I always said, you know, COVID-19, we need a new name for it. COVID-19 is destroying us. Maybe we need to call it Ma 45. 40, Ma means nothingness. 45 means Adam. So the, the, the megastar magget is something beautiful. Nothing can change from one thing to another without first losing his original identity. For example, an egg cannot go into a chicken before it, it stops being an egg. Each thing must come to, to lose its original identity before it comes into something else. Therefore, before a something is transformed into something else, before I want a transformation, before I want a breakthrough, you know what has to come through first? I have to get to a level of nothingness. I have to get to a level where I, I completely divorce my old self. I have to get to a, a level of surrender in my life. I have to take, accept life on life's terms, like Bill W. Uh, says all the time. When you get to that level of nothing, it's like, what do I know? We already spoke about that the essence of knowledge is recognizing you don't know anything. If you want to break through in your life, if you want something beyond, if you want to change your identity, the miracle has to first happen by first losing, get, uh, divorcing the old self and marrying the new self. The new self is widely grand, grandy, gr completely wide open. The old self is such that it's, it's connected to negative beliefs. It's, it's, it's connected to a, the wrong identity. So that's what Rabbi Nachman says. How do you create a miracle? You, the magazine manager says this. How do you create a miracle? You first have to go into nothingness. You have to go into powerlessness. You have to go into a situation in life that you recognize that you are nothing without your creator. The last one we are going to do is 47. So Reb Nachman says here, again, I have four or five of them, but I, again, I don't want to give too much because uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of information here. Lesson 47, Reb Nachman tells us that Somebody who stepped, who steeped in the desire for eating. Let's not only use eating. Let's we could use as eating. We could use as desire for sex. We use it for money. Anybody who's stuck, stuck in these desires is far from the truth, and it's going to be set by judgment. This is a sign of poverty as well. We know that once an addiction starts, poverty comes. Why? Because true falseness. When a person gives an excuse for something, when a person hides under something, he's connected to sheker. He's connected to falseness. We know that sheker, even the words, have no legs. Sheker has nothing to stand on. Something that's not true, it's nothing to, to stand on. Where truth is compared to what? Wealth. Truth is the beginning of God is my light, God is my help. As long as you, you call, God is close to those who call out in truth. So we're not going to say here, that he's going to be embarrassed and he's going to fall into shame. And know that when somebody breaks his desires for eating, God will perform a miracle for you. So a person also has to understand that the leverage, that the, the ability that once you do take these desires and once you do fight your addiction and you, start, you no longer run from them, you have no idea of the light that you are withholding back the light that's coming through the person. The person should not say, well, I'm going to be in recovery. How is my life going to change? Absolutely not. It's going to change dramatically because what's going to happen is, is you're finally going to open up your vessels and you're going to open up the, the, the vessel and you're going to expand your vessels. And now that that light that you're always running after, you're going to have the, a real vessel to, to withhold that light. And after that, Rav Nachman says, comes wealth, comes everything. So it's either we 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 face our face our stuff, face our uh, stuff our face or face our stuff. But when you start facing your stuff in life and you no longer run from it, the the the, the amount of growth, the amount of blessings, and the amount of light 
the person is going to receive, he's going to say, where was I the whole time? So the, the whole point is I want to give people encouragement that it's tough. It's, it's tremendously tough. It's a process. The cravings are, are, are horrendous. It, it, sometimes you feel despair, like I said. But use these 12 or 13 things we just said right now. Use these. Understand the system behind it. You know, if I understand the system behind it, I understand the broken of the vessels, I understand the bread of shame, I understand that everybody has an addiction, I'm no longer, then I can do the 12 steps with a completely different mindset. But if I'm going in there, not even understanding the, how the creation works, and I'm thinking I'm the only one fighting this myself, then I'm, I'm, I, it, it, you're not going to get the same effect. So that's why I try to educate people before to educate them on how, how Hashem runs the world. And when you understand how he runs the world, then you start looking at your addiction as, a, as an opportunity, as not, as not as an obligation. All right? That's today's class. If you have any questions, yes. we're free to take some. Okay. So the first question is, what does it mean to find God? What does it mean to find God? Your soul has, your soul has, it comes from infinite. Our souls are made from godliness. We're, we're created with Ein Sof. Ein Sof is an unlimited amount of light that we're created from. That's a portion of ours. What happens is, is we have klipot that hide the soul, that hide, the, that hide this light. That's the job of evil is to hide light. To find God is to find peace in yourself. To find God is to find truth in yourself. Like Rabbi Nachman says, God is close to those who call out in, in truth. When you get to a point of truth in your life, that is God. When you speak truth, that is God. That's why his God's name is MS. So God's name is ultimately connecting to the truth in your life. That's how I understand it. Okay. The next question is, what lack is connected to the disease of the nervous system? What lack is connected to the disease of the nervous system? This I, I, I don't... I, I says I um, can't answer. Uh, okay. I, yeah, yeah. It could be a medical question. It could be anxiety. I mean, okay. it could be an anxiety-related, probably lack of a moon up, but obviously there's other medical conditions also. That's not, we would need more information to answer that question. Okay. What exactly is this vessel that you keep ma mentioning? Is there a connection right. between God and the person? Rabbi Nachman is saying that anything, what a vessel is, is, how do we make a vessel? Basically, Rabbi Nachman says that God is constantly send, giving us light. It's not a question where whether a person can make money. It's not a question whether a person can get married. It's not a question whether a person can be successful in something. But what happens is, is Hashem, if Hashem would give that person this amount of light without him having a vessel, to withhold that light, that light, that basically that that light would break the vessel. For example, if I give a 15-year-old a Maserati, it's too much light for that kid. If you give, um, you know, somebody that can't handle it. If you get, for example, let's say a person is 22, 23 years old, he's dying to get married, but he's very selfish and he's always taking things personal. He thinks about himself. What do you think is going to happen? He's going to get married. It's going to be too much of a light for him, too much of a light, and he doesn't have a vessel. So what's going to happen is we get divorced. So what, 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 what the vessel teaches us is that anytime we fail, the reason why we fail at something is because the light that we want and the vessel that we, we have are not matching. So basically, failure teaches us that we're, we don't have an adequate vessel for what we're trying to receive. So how do you do it? How do you enlarge your vessel? By praying by learning, by understanding. Just for example, if I have, if I'm, I'm, let's say, for example, I hire somebody, he has 10 years in, in, the, in the industry, then that person gets paid more because that person has already encountered failures and everything. And I don't have to pay, I'm, I'm not going to pay for his mistakes. So his vessel is bigger. So he deserves a, a bigger salary. Let me just switch my headphones because my battery's dead. Hold on. Hello? Loud and clear. Are you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh, do you hear me? 
Yes, do you hear me? One or two, because it doesn't seem to be working. One or two more questions, it doesn't seem to be working. Go ahead. You hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Take one or two or three more questions until the battery dies. Okay. Does all sickness originate from a lack of the soul's desires being addressed? According to Reb Nachman, yes. According to Reb Nachman, every, every issue is a spiritual flaw. According to the Baal Shem Tov also, it pretty much says the same thing. There's a spiritual flaw because sickness is caused by an imbalance in the four elements. And once there's a disharmony in the body, that causes the, one of the things. That's what Reb Nachman says, the cure to healing is happiness, and the and and when a person is unhappy, there's a good chance sickness comes to the person because all harmony comes from healing, and healing comes from the four elements: earth, fire, water, and water. When there's healing, there's balance. It's, there's and what is disease? Disease is dis-ease, a lack of ease in the body. Okay, uh, a viewer asked two questions. The first question is: What is the yes. difference between loving yourself and ego? And the second question is, how can you strengthen your amuna? Okay, loving yourself is recognizing that you're going to fall in life, that but you're putting in effort. So the amount of loving yourself, how do you how do you how do you know you love yourself? Is you're if you're putting effort into yourself. If I'm working on myself, even though I could be broken, even though I could be falling ten times, but I'm still getting up. I'm still invested in myself. Ego is the 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 job of the ego, like we said, humility is thinking, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. So not being always a center of attraction that that person hurt me, that person hurt me, this one's doing that to me. Always thinking about yourself. Like always think, it's, everything's around you. Like you're taking everything personal. Everything's about you in life. That's what the ego does. It takes attention, it, it blames, it projects. It does anything but to do, but to, to take responsibility for something. So the ego makes you act like a victim? Ego makes you act like a victim, of course, because it, 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 the ego cannot take responsibility for anything. I made a mistake. So what happens is look at Adam. What did Adam do? Instead of saying, I made a mistake, I should have listened to you, Hashem. What did he do? He blames his wife. So ego, the, the, the ego always will project blame other people for failures or that I'm gonna, I have an addiction because my parent did it to me or I have an addiction because of that person. Instead of saying, you know what? I never had faith in life. I never worked on my life. I never... You know, I never really, I, 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 it was a comfortable place. So sometimes the fear will stop a person from growing. So he'll say, you know what, this is why I am. So this way he doesn't, he's protecting his ego from failing again. So a lot of people procrastinate, there'd be a, a perfectionism. It's all rooted in the ego, and which is edging God out. And the second one, the second question was, uh, how could you strengthen your amuna? You already have amuna inside of you. You understand? You, we all have the moon inside of us. We're born with it. You have to basically, you have to understand that you have to first have a muna, then yedida. You have to understand in life that sometimes you're not going to understand things. My thing, like I always tell people, that the more you know in life, the, less, the, rec the more you recognize you don't know anything. So sometimes when we give the, the wrong meaning to things, when we get in pain, we're upset, it's because we're giving it meaning on, based on our perspective of reality. But it, really, if your perspective of reality is off, then you, 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 instead of looking at something as an opportunity, you're looking at it as a threat, you're looking at it as a problem. So a muna involves a person losing, losing sometimes his, you know, using his, his heart instead of always logically thinking about everything. Sometimes you just have to go into something. You have to, you have to trust your creator. That's by taking action, not always needing to, to, an answer before. Acting as, you know, when a person has a muna, he can already act like it's already happening for him. He believes that that's some good to him, that he's acting already like he's already cured. person has faith and he's sick. And Muna will allow you to think greater than you feel. You can start already acting like you're healthy. That's what a Muna can do. It can take you to places where the logical mind cannot take you. So how do you keep up with this spiritual high? Well, it's, you're never going to get a high. You're going to go through highs and lows. But what happens is when you're running, you run as fast as you can. But when you're running, when you're down, you're hanging on. The difference is, is spirituality is like a roller coaster. It's like this. Ooh, 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 ooh. When you're high, 
do as much as you can, but, but you have to go down in order to, for the new high. So it's never a keeping high. I don't keep high with it. I have many days that I have a lot of dark days in my life, but I don't, I don't stay there. I don't give it energy. I just let the cloud pass, let the cloud pass. And I know there's a, there's a light coming. Everything in Kabbalah is you have to fall for, for the sake of the rise. There's no such thing as maintaining a spiritual high. It doesn't exist. It's constant yeridot and aliyot, constant downs and ups, downs and ups. But every time you go down, you're making a new high. Every time you go down, it's a little, little low, just like a stock market. Downs, up, downs, up, downs, up. So don't look for that spiritual high all the time because it doesn't exist. Okay. So Let's take the last question, and then we're good. Sure. Can trauma leave while realizing that it's always from God, as opposed to what therapists say, that it starts within you? It's always from God. Everything's from Hashem. I just spoke to you about the, the breaking of the vessels. The breaking of the vessels is something that's constantly happening. Things break in our lives. Things have to break in order for new things to be built in life. It's the story of our lives. And that's why when you look at it, the difference between being in therapy too long, you're talking too much about the past, Hasidut recognizing that the past is the past, and the, the, this moment is a brand new moment. It's always focusing on the moment. The, the world constantly, God constantly recreates the world every single day. So when you recognize that, you recognize that life is, life is a process. It's not about hanging out in the past. It's always moving in the present. When you're living in the present, you're living. If you're living in the past, you're not living. You're still living in the past. So our job is to constantly strengthen ourselves to keep moving. That is your job in this world. Just keep on fixing, keep on moving, and, 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 and this is your life. And when you repair one thing, it'll be great. Next thing you know, you have another thing to repair. You have to get, be, get comfortable becoming uncomfortable. All right, Ariel, I have to run because my headphones are almost done. All right, man? All right. Have a great Hashem, night. bless all of you. You should all have strength. You should have courage. You should be to elevate all of our experiences. Amen.